So that served to break down the walls, and we experienced it. I'd like to ask you, how can you have people on the other side of the wall meet each other? You can think about many ways, but there is an architect who brought people from both sides of the fences face to face with each other, and he will be the next speaker. I'm very excited uh, to his uh, to hear his presentation. There will be a Q and A session afterwards. If you are watching this, you can add a channel at the Kakao Talk ID SBSDD, and we will receive your questions real time. So it's time to meet the person who made this great challenge. I'd like to invite uh, architect Ronald Ryle to the stage. I'd like to show you how to build a teeter-totter. And the first thing you need to do is you need to choose a place to build it. And I chose the border between the United States and Mexico. Because for me, the border is a very interesting place. It's a place where language and food and the cultures of different people rub up against each other in beautiful and violent and sometimes ridiculous ways, like in this photograph here. And it's also a place of horror, and it's also a place of humor. Horror caused by racism, poverty, oppression, and humor as a way to overcome those obstacles. Now, the border is a place that's constantly in flux. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I consider myself a borderland citizen. I'm from a very special place that's surrounded by six kilometer tall mountains. And it borders, it straddles the border between the states of Colorado and the states of New Mexico. But up until 1845, this was the northernmost frontier of Mexico. Now, there's also the source of a river that starts there, and today it defines the boundary between the United States and Mexico. And up until 1845, this was all that was left in Mexico in what is now the United States. And just like today, there was a militarization of that border, military forts that were constructed along the border that were made out of mud these buildings were U.S. buildings, United States buildings, that looked like buildings that were a thousand years old that were built just on the other side. And what I find interesting about this world is that when these two worlds collide, many interesting things happen, like this thousand-year-old house becomes a tourist attraction. And we remember these borders even if they've gone away. So, for example, in the state of Colorado in 1932, the governor created martial law, he declared martial law, and sent troops to the border to keep people from the state of New Mexico from entering the state of Colorado. And if you heard just last week, our president said he was going to build a wall in Colorado. Maybe he forgot how far away Colorado is from the U.S.-Mexico border. We decided to build a teeter-totter in this location, right on the border of the states of Texas, New Mexico, and Mexico. And this is a very interesting place. This is a place where there are 700 miles of wall constructed along that border. And this wall is designed to keep people out. In fact, the way they test it is they test it by taking a vehicle and loading it with 40 tons and smashing it into the wall at 50 miles an hour to show that this wall cannot be penetrated. But there's research going on on the other side as well. Portable, dri portable bridges that can just drive up to the border and allow vehicles to drive right over. Let me show you how that's possible. Sometimes this research works, and sometimes it doesn't. Now, since 1994, 
Over 6,000 people have died trying to cross the border because the wall pushes people to further extremes in the desert. And you might think this wall is constructed right on the border between the United States and Mexico, but in fact, it's constructed several meters and sometimes several kilometers away from the border. But if you zoom in, you'll find something very special is happening at the border. People come together in beautiful ways, despite the wall's intention to keep people apart and away. Now, I've begun to collect these stories, and as an architect, I began to build models and drawings in the form of souvenirs to remember the time when we built a wall and what a crazy idea that was. I built snow globes and keychains and postcards and maps to remember the stories like this, the time a Border Patrol agent bought food from someone just on the other side. Food and money is exchanged to the wall, something that seems entirely normal but becomes illegal by just a couple centimeters of steel. This is my souvenir to remember the time when we could share food and ideas across the wall. I call it the burrito wall. And if the border is a barrier to north and south movement, maybe all of that steel as an armature could facilitate east-west movement through cities. And in fact, it could become a pedestrian bicycle path that connects people within their cities in the green spaces. And when I imagined this bi-national library, I imagined a place where people can go and share books and information and knowledge, and the wall becomes nothing more than a bookshelf. Imagine a theater like this, because the border and the wall is a theater, it's a spectacle and we should invite audiences to the theaters, where audiences can sit on both sides and performers as well. Or a swing that you would enter and go other to the other side of another country until gravity deports you back. The game of volleyball has been played since 1970 along the US-Mexico border to bring people together. With players on both sides, just thinking about each other and negotiating this line in the sand. It's been played since 1970 and it continues to be played today. You can see that they sell beer on both sides. And this is to remember the people who play volleyball along the border. Maybe it makes more sense to construct xylophones along the US-Mexico border instead of walls. My friend Glenn Wayant thinks that's the case, and he's been playing the border for years. He attaches microphones to the wall and plays them like a string instrument, or sometimes he picks up sticks and bang them. He calls these weapons of mass percussion, to think about the weapons of mass destruction that perpetuated the construction of the wall in the first place. This is my souvenir for Glenn. On one side of the wall, it might look like this. Someone is mowing their lawn in their backyard. And on the other side of the wall, it looks like this. The wall becomes the fourth wall of someone's house. So I drew a set of blueprints showing the average size of a house in El Paso and an average size of a house in Juarez, Mexico. And you can see the wall cuts through the kitchen table. Here you see the wall cuts through the living room and here the bedroom. Because the wall not only divides countries, it divides cities, neighborhoods, and it divides families. So in order to choose a site, we need a site where there are children. And if you're familiar with what's happening in the, in the United States today, parents are being separated from their children at the border. And I wanted to do something about this, so I created a poster that we could download and use in protest. And if you're familiar with this sign, this sign was designed by an indigenous person in the United States who was working for the highway department to warn people that immigrants may be dropped off alongside the road, and that would warn on oncoming motorists to be careful and be cautious. And so this is a subversive form of design activism. The silhouette of the father 
is of the civil rights leader Cesar Chavez, and he thought a young girl with pigtails would be someone that drivers empathized with the most. I wanted to call attention to child separation at the border, and I did one simple thing, which is to turn the family to face each other. This poster has been downloaded and used in protest, but I would have never imagined that I would have been allowed to return this sign back to the highway to be seen by hundreds of thousands of motorists in the form of an enormous billboard. So we chose a site where there are children, where you can see children playing and sometimes even climbing the border wall itself. Now we have to determine how much the teeter totter is going to cost. Well, let's think about the wall first. 3.4 billion dollars have been spent constructing the wall since 2006, and it will require 49 billion dollars needed to construct and maintain the wall over the next 25 years. This isn't the wall that our president is talking about. In fact, his wall is intended to cost 70 billion dollars. But let's think about that 49 billion dollar price tag first. What what else could that buy? It could buy 300 Seattle public libraries, or 500 miles of the High Line, or 350 Broad museums. Especially when, no matter how high you build that wall. You'll probably find a ladder that's taller that only costs three hundred dollars. The next thing we have to do is consider the details of design. When we first began to design the wall, we were imagining these scenarios where people could be lifted up over the top of the wall to look over, and we asked permission to build the teeter totters along the border, and we continued to evolve our design. Eventually, deciding that this would be a very simple kind of teeter totter, and families and children could enjoy the teeter totter itself could be slipped right through the wall itself, and we wanted to smuggle design into the border. So we see the wall, but if we look closely, we see a fulcrum that's attached right on the wall, and we begin to test these ideas. And so this is the first ride of the teeter totter. We painted the teeter totters pink. Why? Because we wanted them to stand out from the wall. We wanted them to be fun. But in Juarez, Mexico, pink means something very important. The color pink is used to remember the women who were killed during the femicides in the 1990s. Because remember that the border is both a place of horror and of humor. And so now that we have the design and we've considered the details, it's time to ride the teeter totter. So one day we woke up, and I want you to take a look and see what we did. I'll tell you that when we did this, I was scared to death. I did not know what was going to happen. But we brought families together, children together, and we transformed the border into a place of joy. We transformed the border into a place where usually you only hear about the border being a place of violence, a place where bad men are selling drugs. But we showed the world. That in fact it's a place where women and children live, and they have fun, and they take pictures of their kids with their cell phones, and communities could come together to share a moment of joy and celebration of their cross-national heritage. And even when the soldiers from Mexico showed up to ask, "What are we doing?" we said, "We're having an event with the children," and they stood back, and they smiled, and they took pictures. The Greek mathematician once said, "Give me a lever long enough, and a fulcrum 
on which to place it, and I can move the world. And for 40 minutes that day, we showed the world that play can be a form of activism, and that the actions that take place on one side have a consequence on the other. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give Professor Lyle another big round of applause. Before listening to the presentation, I had some uh, fixed ideas about uh, the different walls that separate uh, two uh, countries. And uh, I realized that we can change this space and zone into a zone of harmony. And we will now have a Q&A session. And uh, we are getting questions uh, live, and we have selected some questions, several questions. Uh, and the first question is, as an architect, you can be inspired by many things. And uh, what made you uh, become interested uh, in the wall and the barrier? Well, I became interested in the wall because I discovered that the wall could be thought of as a form of architecture. And I'm always inspired by this very famous quote that says, architects do not design walls, but the spaces between them. And I'm not an advocate for building walls, but I do think that this is a very important moment when we should be designing those spaces that the wall is putting in danger. Spaces for people, spaces for animals, it's transforming the ecology. And so I was very interested in taking on that challenge. 맞습니다. 우리가 가지고 있던 편견과 You're right. I think that's uh, pretty much what we thought of. We thought it would be a place of conflict and confrontation and uh, strictly guarded. But the fact that you saw this as a place for architectural design is very refreshing. This is the next question we got. Uh, as you made a lot of models, and as you made this structure, I'm sure you felt many things. What did you feel when you saw the place change? Oh, well, that was the most surprising thing, because if you can imagine, this wall is constructed through private property. It's constructed through um, protected wilderness areas. They even wanted to construct this wall through a university. So imagine if you're a student and you have to show your passport in order to go to classes. And so to see this transformation take place along the border and to see the kind of damage and destruction this wall is, is causing, uh, it's really heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And I, w I wanted to step in and see if I can at least tell the story of the construction of this wall to make people know, because I think people do not realize that such a large wall has already been constructed. Because our president, he ran on a platform that said, I will build a wall, when, as I showed, there are already 700 miles of wall there. That's right, and we were able to see that on the video. Through the structure uh, that is the wall, children play with each other. It's a place of harmony, and uh, we can uh, enlarge in the ecosystem uh, in a sense, and I think that can be very inspiring. We are getting uh, live questions as of now. And uh, let me tell you again how you can ask questions. If you uh, add uh, SBS uh, DD, uh, you can ask questions, and we will select the questions uh, for our speaker. Next question. So uh, from an architectural and design point of view, uh, I mean, how did you come up with the idea of approaching the wall in this uh, way? Oh, well. I think what we were really doing is we were remembering the stories and just reaccounting the stories. I showed you the story of playing volleyball. I showed you the stories of playing yoga. There's so many stories about horse racing, um, about people actually being launched over the border. And I just continued to write these stories down, but each of these stories needed an illustration. They needed some way to show these ideas. 
And the teeter-totter was just about a story of thinking about the balance between the United States and Mexico, the labor balances, the trade balances, the equality and inequality. And so that's how these designs emerged. They, they didn't really come from my own imagination. They came from what's happening about, at the border right now. So it's not simply a personal opinion or feeling, but a reflection of reality. Yeah, uh, we're continuously getting questioned. Uh, I'm sure there was some psychological fear because it was the first project of this kind. Did you have any fear? I was very afraid when I <laughs> approached the border. And you can see me coming to the border with these pink tater totters, and I did not know what's going to happen. And I was so afraid that I don't remember the event. I have to watch it to remember. And we, we stuck it in, and then the police came, and they said, what are you doing? And we said, oh, we're playing with the children. And they said, okay. <laughs> and then the soldiers came with the machine guns, and they said, what are you doing? <laughs> and we said, well, we we're playing with the children. And they said, okay. And wow. I couldn't believe it. I, I was amazed because mothers and children that day had the power and I think it's that power that they have that could bring that wall down. Mm. So it's not one person who did it. I mean, even if Professor Ryle had a great idea, uh, I think uh, he needed people to follow him to create this miracle. And uh, I think what was fun was that the pink uh, seesaw when you were carrying it, uh, you had a very serious expression on your face when you were carrying it, and I thought it was kind of funny. But because you tried it and because you had that passion, we are able to hear this amazing story today. Let's uh, go on to the next question. I'd like to talk about the situation in Korea right now. In Korea, we have a wall between uh, those living in the apartment complex and the outsiders, and they say it's because of security reasons, but it's a wall. It's a wall that's been created and built, and uh, we see the appearance of different walls in society. What do you think about that? Well, as I mentioned before, I think we have to think not about those walls, but we have to think about the spaces that they define. And if we think about those spaces, we can transform those spaces to be beautiful and humanitarian and useful spaces. And there, the, walls are important. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I, I recently wrote an article that there are many people in the United States that say, that we need a wall between the United States and Mexico. And their critique is, that they say, well, you have walls around your house, so why can't we have walls around our country? Hmm. And so I said to myself, well, is a, wall, is a house a country? Because if it is, maybe we need a roof over our country. Maybe we need a kitchen in our country. And what does that mean? Maybe we need, a pl we need to be able to feed all of the residents of the country healthy food. Maybe we need a medicine cabinet in our country. And we are able to have health care for all the nation. We d in the United States, guns are a problem. And we don't shoot at people within our house. So why should we shoot at people in our country? And we also, when people come knocking at our door to ask for help, we don't detain them and separate families from their children. So why are we doing that in our country? I think that's the important thing to remember. You're right. Rather than focus on, on the wall itself, we should focus on how we can change the space that's defined by the walls. This is a question related to North and South Korea. Of course, we can't expect the ideologies of uh, both Koreas to change. Uh, we have to recognize the difference, and we have to recognize that we can't uh, go to each other's countries. But between the two countries, what can be built? Do you have any ideas? That's <laughs> uh, a very difficult question. That is a difficult question. But I think something is already yeah. being built, and maybe you don't realize it, that there's an enormous space that's becoming a space of wildlife. 
it's becoming a space of nature. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it that way, that there is this protected zone between the two countries. And if the two countries ever become friends, if those barriers ever come down, what you will have left between you is one of the most beautiful parks in the world. And that's going to be amazing. Because there's, a there's an opportunity there to think about. That at some point in the future, if friendships are made, people will have the, the opportunity to experience a place where wildlife exists, where plants live, where they were preserved because of the tensions that exist between those two countries. So in some ways, you can be optimistic and hope for those connections to be made in some, someday, and that when you do, you'll be holding hands in a forest. Mm. That was a very difficult question, so I wasn't sure uh, what type of answer we would receive, but that was a great answer. But I think the uh, North-South uh, Korean issue is an issue of division and separation, and that's a key word. And uh, the uh, seesaw is still remaining uh, on that wall, and uh, people are still playing and using the seesaw. I think people want to know whether that is really happening. Is it still used? Um, we, we took it down. Mm. And what, it, it's not legal to permanently attach something to the, attach to something to the wall. And so we had to remove it. Uh, but we were not asked to remove it. We simply took it down ourselves. In fact, the, the main reason we pulled it away is because, like all children, they got tired of playing on the teeter-totter. They had enough. And so what we're doing now is we're now going to show the teeter-totter at the National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. Mm. And we're going to be able to show the world the teeter-totter so they can see it and they can experience it. And we're also going to build a wall so people can understand the kind of wall that exists because not everyone can travel to the border and a lot of people are afraid to travel to the border. But I, I think when they see that wall and they see how big it is, they'll realize, hopefully, what a mistake it is. So you heard that they had to remove it from the site, but it will be shown to the rest of the world at a museum, and it will give us the meaning of that structure. Do you have other plans for the future other than this, some sort of other structure that you're planning to build? Um, well, in, in some ways, I have plans to build things. And in some ways, I have plans to unbuild things. So I will say that when we, we asked the museum uh, how we should show it, I said, what we really have to do to really show it is we have to cut the wall and take it into the museum. <laughs> and they said, well, I don't think we can do that by April, but we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> so all these ideas are, are ways to think about how we might dismantle the wall. And I have a book called Border Walls Architecture that's full of these kinds of drawings. And so we do have other ideas and concepts. Uh, one concept that we've been thinking about is to build the binational library, mm -hmm. to build half on one side and half on another side, and make a place where a librarian can come to the wall and read books to children and children can check out books from one side and they'll have a place to sit and read and the librarian will have a sit place to sit and read and they can share because there's also books of different languages to share, books in English, books in Spanish and so that's one plan that we have. Yeah. So uh, it's very creative and it's a new way of looking at things and uh, yes, uh, taking a part of the wall to the museum, that's a great idea. And uh, you also have a project for a library and I think uh, that would be also very interesting. Oh, we are getting a lot of difficult questions. <laughs> I mean, we're not just talking about a physical wall, but we also have an intangible, invisible wall, uh, emotional walls between people. So how can we destroy that emotional barrier between people? Um, that's a very good question. And I don't, I don't know if architects can answer that question. But I, what I'll say about that <laughs> is that I think that there is a global movement around the world to construct walls. And I think that that is simply a physical manifestation 
of the walls that we are building between ourselves. We are building walls um, between different religions and our disagreements about different races and our disagreement about different uh, sexual orientations. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also happening around the globe. And different political affiliations, especially. And so, if we agree that we might want to dismantle physical walls, and we want to work hard to do that, maybe we should also make an agreement to try to break down those emotional walls, those cultural walls, those walls of belief that we are building between each other. And, and we, we have to be cognizant of, of that. We have to recognize that that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop it and move backwards. And I think we have to begin to mm -hmm. have the kind of generosity that it takes to ride a teeter-totter. Right? When you ride a teeter-totter, the teeter-totter itself is dangerous. <laughs> And it's dangerous because you don't know what the person on the other side is going to do. He could just jump off and then you <laughs> fall down and hit the ground. But he probably won't. And it requires you to make that other person have an experience. Right? It's up to you. There's a generosity that's needed to have this experience on both sides. So if we think about the world like a teeter-totter, mm -hmm then we could think about having fun with other people, being generous with other people, and recognizing again that what we do here has a consequence over there. And so if we do something bad here, something bad is going to happen over there. If we do something good here, something good is going to happen over there. You're right. Uh, having, uh, asking a psychological question to an architect is something that I hesitated a little bit about. But uh, your example of comparing it to a teeter-totter was really relevant. If I jump off, then the other person on the other side could get hurt. So. It means that we need to make joint efforts together, and that will allow us to tear down walls between minds. I think I have to go to the last question. You mentioned design activism. Can you talk about design changing the world? Yes, I'll try. I teach a class at the university called design is activism. Because I think every time someone designs something, they're, they are changing the world. They're putting, whether you're designing a seat, uh, and it's soft and it can turn around, or uh, whether you're designing a building or a room, you're making change. And that's really what activism is. It's about petitioning for change. It's about doing something to change. And if you recognize that, as a designer, that you have control of that, then maybe you can change the world in a really positive way. And so this is what design activism is all about. It's about recognizing that, as a designer, you can be transformative. But I don't think that only applies to designers or architects. I think it applies to everyone in the world. That the choices you make about the foods you eat, about what you do in the morning and what you do at night, the way you interact with people, that's all design, because you're thinking about how you're engaging the world and how you might transform the world. And so, so this, is, this is design activism.